Hello there, happy innovators. How are you guys doing today, huh? You know, I woke up today and I decided I'm going to do some talking today. I'm going to do a singularity. I'm going to do it, you know, because I missed you. Ah, <laughs> I did though. Um, you know, right now we're in the middle of the NBA playoffs. And uh, Golden State Warriors competing against the Houston Rockets and the Boston Celtics competing against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And, you know, I live near Boston and I was born in Cleveland. And it's one of those rare occasions where I'm kind of like rooting for both teams. Like it doesn't matter uh, which team wins or loses really to me okay which is kind of cool <laughs> i actually am enjoying it i think maybe a little bit more and i want to talk about this a little bit i promise i won't you know go on for too long about sports because i'm not sure how many of you are dialed into that kind of thing or enjoy that kind of thing but um i will say this about the cleveland cavaliers Okay, well, while we're watching the playoffs, the Celtics playing the Cavaliers, it kind of like occurred to me while we were watching it, like, I never really liked basketball. It's a sport that I have very little understanding of. Uh, and, you know, while we're watching the playoffs, I'm kind of like asking myself this question, like, I wonder why, you know, I got baseball, I got football, I got hockey, but I never really latched on to basketball. And I think the reason is, okay, that when I was growing up, the Cleveland Cavaliers sucked, okay? I mean, they were terrible. They were terrible. They never did anything. I mean, not even a whiff of playoff competition. Okay, not even a whiff of it, not even a little bit. They sucked and there was just nothing there. If you were a basketball fan in Cleveland back in, you know, what, you know, anywhere from, well, anywhere, <laughs> anywhere prior to LeBron James playing for the Cavaliers, there was nothing there for you, you know, and I think that that's why. When I watch basketball now, I don't really know all the rules. I don't really know much about it. I don't, you know, it's uh, it's foreign to me in a lot of ways. But it is amusing to me and entertaining to me that now the Cleveland Cavaliers are like one of the best teams in the NBA, you know, and it's just shocking to me. Okay, that's that's all I'm going to say about it. It's just really shocking to me that, uh, you know, the Cavaliers, the Cleveland Cavaliers are, you know, have not only won a championship in the past three years, but they're contending for the championship every year. So that's like really shocking to me. But it is also cool, right, that... Uh, you know, Boston and Cleveland are competing against each other. And just one of those rare occasions where it doesn't matter to me which team wins or loses, really. Um, so anyway, now that I got that out of the way, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit today about something that I was thinking about. And what I want to talk about is the difference between um, wisdom and intelligence that there is a big difference between those two things I think they often get confused with each other or um, obscured you know uh, wisdom versus intelligence like it brings me to this question like what should be valued more you know wisdom or intelligence and you know when I ask myself that question all right um, I kind of 
I kind of go here. I, 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 it kind of leads me to this question, which is, do I know anyone, okay, that I would consider to be intelligent? Or do I know anyone that I consider to be wise? Okay. Now, when I ask myself the question, do I know anyone that I would consider to be intelligent? First of all, I'll tell you this, okay? My talking about wisdom and intelligence does not imply that I'm either wise or intelligent, okay? Um, because I do not consider myself to be wise and I do not consider myself to be particularly intelligent, okay? Um, <laughs> so let's get that out of the way first. But. Do I know anyone that I consider to be intelligent? And I would say yes. I know actually quite a few people that I would consider to be intelligent. And these are people I know personally. I mean, I, I would say I know quite a few very intelligent people. Um, but then there's that second question. Do I know anybody that I consider to be wise? And I have tried to sift through my memories, my past, my present. I mean, I, I have studied this question. Do I know anybody that I consider to be wise? And the answer is no. Okay. I don't think I know anybody that I would consider to be wise. Now that's a pretty hardcore reality to face, isn't it? Like I live in this world of people that are intelligent, but just because you're intelligent doesn't mean you're wise and vice versa. You know, just because you're wise doesn't mean that you're intelligent. They're not the same thing. So I suppose what I should do is bust out my handy dandy new Oxford American dictionary again. And I'm going to read you a couple of definitions just to emphasize my point here. So we'll start with the definition of intelligence. Intelligence, according to the new Oxford American Dictionary. Okay. The ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Intelligence. Okay. Now we're going to swing all the way over to the other side of this dictionary to wisdom. Okay. So let's see. According to the new Oxford American Dictionary, the definition of wisdom. The quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. Okay. So that sounds like a pretty strong foundation to start this conversation with, you know, uh, clearly a difference between intelligence and wisdom. And when you ask yourself the questions, like, do you know anybody who's intelligent? Do you know anybody who's wise? Oh my gosh, it's like this, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a storm of questions that come, you know, um, at least for me, okay? And, <laughs> you know, I have to say, and I, and, you know, I try to be an optimist, okay? trying to be optimistic most of the time. Um, but I can't help but think like we live in a time where most of the people on the planet, probably, <laughs> okay, uh, as far as I can tell, lack wisdom, <laughs> myself included. Okay. We live in probably the most unwise period of human history. Okay. But 
what's weird about that is at the same time, we're probably living in the most intelligent time in human history. Okay. (laughs) And it begs the question, you know, what is more important, intelligence or wisdom? And of course, they're both important and they're probably really, um, there's probably a little bit of both in all people. Okay. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, you know, having the characteristics of intelligence and wisdom, like predominantly in your day to day life or your, the, the way you live your life. Right. And, and I have to say that I am almost 100% sure, okay, that I can't think of a person that I know of that I would consider wise. And, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were watching the movie Gone with the Wind. Great movie, uh, you know, a classic, you know, of course. Um, just you know, considered to be one of the greatest films of all time, right? And I love the movie, okay? There's a lot of great things about it. And, and I, like I've said before, and I'll say it again, I mean, I'm one of those people who believes that, you know, art imitates life and vice versa, right? But, you know, we're watching the movie, and, and in case you are unfamiliar with the movie Gone with the Wind, and the storyline of the movie. I'll give you a quick synopsis of the movie. It's about the Civil War and the events around the fall of the South uh, during the Civil War and all those kinds of things. The the climate and the, the personal interactions of people and the circumstances around the Civil War right before it happened and then what it eventually led to um, at the end of the war. And there are a lot of great things in this movie, a lot of great points, a lot of things to watch and, you know, think about and consider whatever. Okay. But one of the things that always stood out to me about that film is at the very beginning of the movie, the characters in the film gone with the wind at the very beginning of the movie are kind of like reveling in this romantic, you know, gushy kind of glory of war and they can't wait for the war to start and you know they want to defend their way of life and whatever you know and it always kind of stuck out to me because of course we know how it ends right we know how the civil war ended but I would imagine that that kind of you know, romance, that that kind of romantic uh, anticipation or whatever of war and, and glory was probably happening on both sides of that war, you know, that there were people who were ready and anxious to fight, you know. But it always kind of stuck out to me in my memory because when you really think about it, especially, like I said, because we know how the Civil War ended, that's not very wise. Okay, they're not, they were not very wise. And, um, I guess it makes me think about now, okay, that we live in this political climate where there are these two groups of people that are extremes on, you know, the right wing and the left wing extremists okay and there's like you know terminology being floated like antifa and you know uh there's talk of you know what like revolution and those kinds of things and i can't help but wonder you know when I hear about that kind of stuff and when I see that kind of stuff, I mean, it's just permeating, uh, popular culture. You know, it's, it's just everywhere. It's like this, these two groups of people that are edging closer and closer to that line, the line 
of demarcation, you know, the line of war. And they're anxious to get there. They're, they're um, egging it on. You know, they want to kickstart it. And I can't help but think, do they lack wisdom? You know, and you know, it makes me think, you know, and like I've said before in other uh, singularity podcasts, you know, I'm a centrist and I am not political, you know, but I can't help but see and observe uh, what is happening in the world around me. And I have to come to some conclusions about things. And I got to tell you, it's a bit concerning and worrisome. There are these people walking around that are kind of like those guys at the beginning of Gone with the Wind. You know, they have this romantic notion of what conflict and war really means and what they fail to recognize is that historically war regardless of why it's happening or where it's happening is always horrible for everyone involved okay it's it's miserable even if the cause is noble it's war is devastation for all okay uh at least that's how i see it and that's reason to pause for a moment isn't it and consider that um you know it makes me think about this uh a while ago i was watching this documentary film on the children of the famous you know nazis that were executed at nuremberg and you know uh the the fallout okay for those people you know the relatives of hitler and the relatives of Goering and uh you know, it's really a revelation to see because their lives are destroyed. Okay. Uh, how do I say this? Okay. There's this thing I have been kind of focusing on lately. It's this idea of generational curses. Okay. And wow, this idea that you may see somebody doing something to someone that is cruel and horrible and they kind of like seem to get away with it. Okay. But in my thinking and in my belief system, okay, especially after kind of getting into this idea of generational curses, I kind of have a different understanding. Okay. And I'll share that with you. Okay. Um, this idea of generational curses is kind of like, basically, you know, you have somebody who does something wrong to someone else. Okay. And they get away with it. Okay. No one ever finds out. Right. But there's this belief. Okay that God sees everything, okay? God meets out justice and people don't see it, okay? They don't realize that you don't ever get away with anything, okay? Any wrong you do to someone else, you don't get away with it. God hits where it hurts, okay? When he enacts revenge on behalf of a wrong that has been done to someone okay it is devastating okay so to kind of paraphrase okay or so to kind of deduce it 
down to simple terms, okay? Uh, you may do something wrong to someone and you think you get away with it, but you never really do. Or if you are someone who has been wronged by someone and maybe in a really horrible way, all right? You don't need to seek revenge, okay? Because God will mete out revenge on behalf of that wrong that has been done. And if you don't believe that, okay, I suggest that you watch that documentary on the children of the Nazis. You know... When the Nazis were hatching their plan for world domination, okay, they probably never even considered, nor could they imagine, that not only would they be defeated by the Allies, right, but all of the wrong that they had done would, one, for future generations, it would never be forgotten and ultimately it would be their children their grandchildren their great grandchildren that would pay the price for what they had done I am pretty sure it probably was not something that was occurring to anyone at that time now think about that think about that that's some pretty hardcore stuff and like I was saying when you watch that documentary about the children of the Nazis and how their lives played out the ancestors you know the future generations that came after these guys after these you know war criminals were you know had done what they were doing and had ultimately you know paid the ultimate price uh, you know, with their lives or whatever, okay. Uh, not only would they pay the price, but every generation after would. And that's a lesson. It's a lesson. You know, it never occurs to you know the uh, the instigators of conflict. And the people who relish the idea and the glory and the romance of, you know, storming into battle for their cause and, you know, taking over, you know, Uh, it never occurs to them that they might lose. You're picking a fight you're going to lose. Never occurs to them. You know, all they can see is the romance and the... (laughs) This, this projected outcome that they imagine in their minds, but it never occurs to them that they might lose. And that is a lack of wisdom. You know? I mean, it's one thing to be provoked into conflict and to defend yourself, okay? Or to intercede when there's a wrong being done. You know, to step in and, and stop it. Okay, but it's another thing to just arbitrarily pick a fight, right? And think about that, because a lot of people probably don't, you know? War is bad for everyone, not just one side or the other. It's devastation, you know? Even if you win, you lose. Think about it. Some wars are probably just, I guess, but most aren't. And even if they are just, it doesn't really matter because it will ultimately mean devastation. And, you know, back to that idea of generational curses, it's kind of an interesting thing to examine because the more you examine it, the more you realize that it's true. That... You may think you're getting away with something and you're not. You never do. God sees everything. God does see everything. 
and justice will be meted out and he'll hit where it hurts. He'll hit your children. You may know actually what I'm talking about. Like you might know a family, okay, where you see this play out. It may even be your own family, you know, where it's like, for instance, you have a family where generation after generation after generation has a problem with alcoholism, you know, just like, and people go, oh, you know, he's just like his father, you know, his father had a drinking problem and, you know, it's just, you know, he learned it from his father. No, he did not learn it from his father. He inherited it. He inherited it. And it, the cycle goes on and on and on until you break that generational curse. You have to, you have to end it. And until you're aware of it and until you end it, it will keep going on and on and on. God hits where it hurts. What's more painful, right? What's worse, to do something wrong and get punished or to do something wrong, not get caught, but then have someone else you love more than you love yourself even. You know, watch them get punished. What hurts more? To watch someone else pay the price for what you did wrong. That's, in my opinion anyway, how God works. Okay? That's a, a pretty out there kind of thing, but consider it. This idea of inviting conflict into your life lacks wisdom and probably intelligence too. There are plenty of intelligent people who are ready to wage war. And I don't just mean, you know, military war. I mean conflict, you know, it lacks wisdom. It lacks wisdom, in my opinion. So let's get back to the question. What's more important, intelligence or wisdom? What should you seek? What's more important? I don't know. I don't claim to know, because like I expressed to you earlier, I don't consider myself to be either wise or intelligent. But here's another thing I want to kind of talk to you about when it comes to this intelligence versus wisdom thing, right? Um, there's this term called red shirting, okay? Red shirting. It's a new thing I've learned about just in the past few weeks. Um, and I guess what I can do is I can read you the definition of red shirting. Okay. So again, I got my handy dandy new Oxford American dictionary and I will read you the definition of red shirt. R E D S H I R T. A college athlete who was withdrawn from university sporting events during one year in order to develop skills and extend the period of playing eligibility by a further year at this level of competition. Okay. Um, now, I never heard the term red shirting before, honestly. Uh the concept is something I'm familiar with, you know, the process of what they're doing. I just didn't know they had a word for it. And basically what it is, is like when you have a college athlete, uh, take a year off of school so that when he comes back to the sport, okay, he gets one more year of eligibility to play. Okay. But he has a year's worth of maturing under his belt. So basically the idea is you have, you know, a 22 year old guy playing in a 21 year old sport, that extra year. Okay. That process of holding that athlete back is called red shirting. Okay. Now that's bad enough. Okay. Cause it's probably, you know, a form of cheating. Okay, but what has come to my attention recently, okay, is that 
what's happening now is parents are starting to redshirt their children in preschool. <laughs> yeah. Like, they hold their child back a year. So they do preschool, you know, two years in a row with the expectation that when this said child is, you know, of age to play sports, they'll have an advantage over their competitors, their <laughs> their future competitors. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, holding your kid back so they could play high school football better? Holding your kid back in preschool? <laughs> it's like, you know, it was outrageous enough to be holding your college student son or daughter back a year so that they could play, you know, lacrosse or, you know, whatever sport, you know, they would have that advantage over their competitors, a year's worth of growth and maturity over their competitors. And then it bumped down to like the high school level, you know, parents red shirting, you know, holding their high school student back a year so that they could be a better athlete and have a competitive edge, okay? Then it bumped down into like elementary school. Okay, parents started to redshirt their elementary school, their adolescent children, okay, holding them back a year in school, you know, not because their grades were bad, okay, not because they needed to repeat the grade, but because they wanted them to play better basketball in high school. And <laughs> talk about lack of wisdom, right? But now it's all the way back to preschool. Parents are redshirting their preschoolers so that they can play better high school football. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. You know, when I heard about that, ah, face palm, you know, like, ha, oh, you've got to be kidding, you know, holding your kid back, red shirting your kid so they could play better sports in high school <laughs> or college or something. What a stupid idea. What a, <laughs> well, probably both unintelligent and unwise, but let's just stick with the unwise thing. I mean, would you argue that? You've got to be kidding me. There's another thing. One last thing I'm going to bloviate about when it comes to this lack of wisdom. You know, they've stopped teaching cursive to young students in school. They have eliminated teaching cursive. Okay. Because the, the children of today, okay. The, 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 future citizens of our world, um, of our civilization, um, are all using their cell phones and typing more than they're writing. So cursive, you know, script writing in script, because there's, you know, printing and writing in cursive, you know, uh, like we were all taught. Well, they've eliminated that now from most of the schooling, at least in America. And a lot of people don't really th seem to have a problem with it. You know, not a very big deal. Oh, it makes sense. You know, that makes sense. They don't need to write cursive anymore. And that is so stupid. <laughs> it is so unwise. I mean, that is so unwise, if you ask me. That is not, that is not a wise move to, you know, to eliminate the teaching of, you know, writing in cursive, signing your name, <laughs> your signature. Okay. I mean, think about that. How many times in one month, okay, 
do you sign your name? You don't type it. You have to sign it. You know, think about that and how personal your signature is. <laughs> just, we live in a time that just, oh, it just lacks wisdom. I have to leave it there for now because I don't have enough time to keep going. But I probably will. I probably will continue this because, ugh. What's more important, intelligence or wisdom? Uh, and, you know, hey, just for the sake of, I don't know, whatever. Go Celtics, go Cavs. Hey. Right. Um, so for now, this is Mike Bostwick from Pipe Choir Records signing off. And remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy.